Hey, it's Zedrin again, here with part 2 of how to animate in CSP. Last time we had a crash course in how to navigate the interface in Clip Studio Paint. Now it's time for us to actually start animating. We're going to start by sketching our animation out, which is probably the most important phase of animating. If any phase deserves the most attention, it's probably going to be this one. After all, animation is all about representing motion. Even if you have amazing art quality, if your animation and your movements aren't believable, it's going to still wind up looking stiff and choppy. I'm going to be reanimating a shot from my animation, Hero the Dense. I've grabbed a few reference images to help with this process. For your first time animating, however, I would recommend doing something that's easy for you to draw. A sack of flour or even just a bouncing ball are very popular tests and are recommended for a lot of first time projects. If you want to be a bit extra and do a character, I'd just recommend doing one that's easy for you to draw that you can do repeatedly. As mentioned in the last tutorial, the first step once our timeline is up is to make an animation folder. In my head, I'm already planning out what the most important poses and frames are going to be for this. Looking at the original, there's about four keyframes that I can anticipate for this motion. His idle state, his initial reaction, him reaching for his sword, and the final pose with his sword drawn. Everything else is more of an in-between or transition. If I need to add in more frames, I can easily do that. This is mostly just the conceptual stage, so I don't need to be one-to-one -one accurate with what the final product will be. For my first pass, I simply want to get a basic motion done. So I'm going to draw mostly stick-like figures, sort of like an animatic. A lot of people assume that you need to be a phenomenal artist in order to animate, but that's not necessarily true. You only need to know a few basic things about drawing, because it will speed things up greatly. And if you're trying to do something more complex, naturally being able to draw more complex things will make that process easier. That kind of goes without saying. But for just getting the motion down, you don't need to go all out. You can just do stick figures like I'm doing here. I personally don't want to really do too much yet because I want to make sure the timing works well first. I'll move a few frames around to make sure everything feels well paced before I start with some sketchy in-betweening. Onion skinning makes this process a little bit easier too, as I can line up parts that don't move and make sure to keep the parts that do move the same length. If you remember, I use pink and blue for my onion skin. Blue for next, pink for previous, which is actually, when I think about it, the reverse of what the norm is. As a reminder, you can change your onion skin colors from Animation, Show Animation Cells, Onion Skin Settings. You can even edit the range that onion skin works on. I have mine set up to show the surrounding two frames rather than the surrounding one, but you may want to limit yourself to just one because that'll be less messy for you. Next, it's time to start doing some of the in-betweens. Again, this phase isn't detailed. I only care about the movement. I want to get some squash and stretch going too. Squash and stretch is a basic animation principle. Things essentially have a form of inertia or weight. As they accelerate, their weight will drag behind them, stretching them out, making them longer and thinner. When they collide with something, they'll stop, with the weight crashing into them, making them flatter and fatter. Oftentimes, when something starts to move, it might briefly move in the opposite direction as well, with a little bit of deformation called an anticipation. Think about it like when you jump. You bend down before you spring up into the air. For my animation, Hero will spring up when he gets startled, which is a stretch animation. Then he will quickly rush down to grab his sword, which will be a squash. For the stretch, I actually want to reuse the initial starting frame, and there's a few ways to do this to save time. My preferred option for duplicating frames is similar to how you duplicate layers. Up top, if you go to Layer, there's an option to duplicate layer. I personally have bound this to Control j just because it was what I used in a few other programs before moving to CSP. If you're in animation mode, or using an animation folder, this won't automatically assign it a spot on the timeline, however. So after you do this, you have to use Specify Cells in order to get it to show up on the timeline. Another method to do this is to make a new cell on the timeline. If you hold down Control as you click the thumbnail of a layer in the Layer Browser, you can make a selection of it even if it's not the active layer. You can then use Alt plus Delete to fill in your current selection. This will all make it one solid color, so it really only works for line art. If you want to do anything with color, I'd recommend using the other method. I tend to use both of these methods myself, and often flip-flop between which one that I use. They're both about equally as fast. Either way, when I finally have my new frame in the proper spot, I'll use the Transform tool, with Control t to deform it upwards. Holding Control allows me to move the corners and the edges to distort things, which is what I want. For frame 3a, the squash, I will do the duplication trick, but also make sure that Hero reaches past where his sword was. This is another concept similar to Anticipation called Overshoot, where the animation goes past its final destination and then springs back to where it wanted to go originally, as if it almost went too fast and overcompensated. Similarly to Smears, I like to describe it as movement that appears between frames. Fighting games often use Overshoot with smearing to make the attacks look faster than their engine can render, as well as put more visual power behind them. 
Hero also wobbles a bit when he draws his sword as a final form of overshoot. As you can see here, the animation looks pretty decent and believable even if it's very incomplete. It's very clear what's going on even if he just has little stick arms. Anatomy and drawing ability are important, but as mentioned, the most important thing with animation is movement. The other stuff you can worry about later. I also want to give a little bit of a reminder from the last tutorial, make sure you have previous and next frame bound to an input. These options can be accessed from animation, move frame. I personally have these bound to comma and period. As I work on an animation, I will often go back and forth to scrub through the animation to see how it looks manually. This is very important for making sure that your animation is consistent and accurate. Next, I'm going to clean up this animation a little bit. This is actually an optional step. From here, you actually could go straight to line art, but I like to make my sketches a little bit more clear before doing so. And it also finalizes the motion. I'm going to make another animation folder and start sketching out things in full rather than like a stick figure. And I'll start just with the keyframes first. One thing I want to point out, for fast motions, I'm creating what's called a smear. Think of it like a hand-drawn motion blur. There are many, many ways to do smears, and I'll cover a lot of them later, but if a movement is super fast, you may want to avoid drawing some details and instead smear the elements. Like for instance, you might notice Hero's right elbow doesn't exist in this frame at all, and his body is snaking and distorted. The sword is just a giant blur, but all these things are good things that help sell the movement because they only appear for a single frame. I can use the same duplication trick from before to add the final little wiggle to the end. I'll also deform the sword, making it wobble back and forth, because swords are made of flexible metal. Playing the animation back, it looks like one of the frames actually isn't really that necessary, so I'll cut it out. Fewer frames will mean that the animation plays back faster, which sometimes might be what you want. And also, fewer frames that you need to draw means that it's less work for you, which is a win-win. One little quick note on that prospect as well. Many people tend to assume that to get smooth animation you want to have as many frames as possible, which really is not true. If you want to get smooth animation, you want to make sure that your frames are very deliberate and very accurate. Animation smoothness comes from how well the motions are conveyed, not how many frames you have. So focus on that first before adding in extra frames. And again, fewer frames is less work for you. Anyway, this is looking pretty good, so I think we're ready for line art, which we'll be covering next time.